Welcome, welcome to our church, the Evangelical Baptist Church, and welcome to our community forum on the future of Puerto Rico. I see. So uh, we need to have plenty of conversations yes. about the future of our beautiful island. island so, yeah. so welcome to our church, and hopefully the conversation will be constructive and people will, you know, this could raise some consciousness about the, the need that we have down there, right, to help our people. Thank you for the opportunity for the, for the forum, yeah. you know, oh, to yeah. be able to do this. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. We, we have to do something. Um, and conversation is very important. That's right. And it's getting cold. <laughs> We usually take the train back. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. From the, so, so nice to um, have you all here. Welcome to the Evangelical Baptist Church, La Iglesia Evangelica Bautista. Um, we like to call ourselves La Calle Ocho, uh, but, but not the Miami one. Uh, so, not the Boricua Miami one. one. But this, this is a Boricua one, right? This is, this is a good one too. But uh, it's, it's nice to have you here, and um, I'm glad that you're all here. It's an important event. Uh, at least that's how we see it. And I think your presence right, uh, uh, testifies to that reality. Uh, we care about the future of Puerto Rico. Yes. Uh, we care for its people. Um, and those there and those in the diaspora, many of you here, many Boricuas in the house. Yeah. All right, all right. And um, so we're glad that you came to share this moment with us. Uh, and we're glad to have uh, Nelson Dennis, the author of War Against All Puerto Ricans, a round of applause for Nelson. So just a, a quick note, um, Nelson's a very special person to me. We've known each other for over 20 years, but um, not only he's a gem of a person, but he actually gave me my, my start in politics uh, in East Harlem. I was uh, about to start undergrad, and he said, you know, why don't you just join me and my staff? So we worked together for four years, um, and you know, I, I continued, and he continued his, his own journey, and which, which led us to the best center war against all Puerto Ricans. Uh, so I appreciate Nelson so much. And Dr. Samuel Cruz, a round of applause. I also know Dr. Cruz for almost two decades now. Um, uh, Dr. Cruz and my brother uh, were both PhD students at Drew University. Uh, this was in the 90s. And that's when I first met Sam. So he met me when I was 30 pounds lighter, when I had hair, and not a big panza. So, um, so uh, I know Sam for a very long time, so I'm glad that he's here. He's Associate Professor of Religion and Society at Union Theological Seminary, and he's also the pastor of the Trinity Lutheran Church in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. Any Brooklynites in the house? Yeah. All right. Yeah. So good to have you here. And I, I, um, there's, there's a lot of folks here that I know, Felipe Luciano, and Chris Monson is going to come up uh, in, in one second. Uh, Lila, who is the, um, one of the leaders for a wonderful local community-based organization called Why Not Care More. Lila, why don't you stand and wave, wave, wave your hands up to Chris Don't Care. Um, <laughs> So Lila's uh, joined, um, we've, we've partnered with them to, to do our donation drive for the people of Puerto Rico, so we thank them for their uh, efforts. And I have to recognize my good friend, uh, also known him for such a long time, he's very dear to me, and very dear to the Puerto Rican diaspora community here in New York City because he's a pioneer. Uh, in, in Latino politics in this city, and that is Assemblyman Jose Rivera. Uh, let us stand, Jose, so he can hear me. There we go. Let me tell you, Jose broke ground for many of the Latino politicians in this city, um, and he did it in the Bronx, and he continues to serve our people in the great city of Albany. So it's so good to see you. And I have to say uh, a special thank you to uh, the members of my church here. They're there in the back, but thank you for making the, all this possible. Gracias por hacer todo esto posible. Raise your hand, levanten su mano. Saluden, ahí están, ahí están. 
all the rest are in the kitchen. So after our forum, uh, there's some finger foods here, so please feel free to partake. Before we start, um, I want Chris uh, Monson, who's uh, one of the leaders of uh, a, a neighboring church over here, uh, to just say a quick prayer. The, the people of Puerto Rico needs prayer. They need prayer. Um, so I just wanted to just start the occasion uh, with, a, with a quick prayer. And uh, Chris Monson is here with, um, he, he passed, he's a, what, in the pastoral staff, right? Of uh, Abounding Grace, uh, one of our neighboring churches. So Chris, please. Can we hold hands, Pastor? Oh yeah, there's. Please hold hands. Feel free to hold hands, absolutely. Oh. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy and we thank you for your grace. We thank you for this opportunity to gather, Lord, as people of faith, as people of conscience, yes, as people of action, dear Heavenly Father. Yes. We pray that we would leave here uh, edified, inspired, Lord God, Father God, that we would leave with tools, Lord God, to do what it is you've called us to do in this season. Yes. Lord, if you've called us to engage the powers, help us to engage the Amen. powers with all that we have, Lord Amen, God. Lord. If you've called us to, to confront the powers, Lord God, help yes, us to Lord. confront the powers, Lord yes, God, with Lord. the prophetic voice dear heavenly father yes, lord. lord i pray that each one here lord god would walk in their calling in this season lord god yes. father god we pray for the island of puerto rico lord father we pray for all those right now lord god who are suffering dear heavenly father lord uh even now the, the prayer request of a mother whose son drank some contaminated water and now who is in dire health lord god we pray for him right now lord god we pray for resources lord god we pray for sound leadership and strategic planning dear heavenly father we pray that the resources would meet the people who need them lord god on the margins lord god father god we pray lord god that this would be a tipping point lord god for the island of puerto rico lord god enough is enough lord god and we pray right now lord god God, oh, that we would oh, take oh, our role, Lord God, and do what we can, yes, Lord yes, God, yes, for the yes. betterment of the island, Lord God. So we pray yes. now for the speakers, Lord. Yes. We pray that you give them the tongue of the learned, Lord God, and we yes. pray that each one would have ears to hear and hearts yes. to receive. Hearts In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Chris. Uh, and just a quick hello to Dr. Efrain Agosto. Uh, he's uh, a recognized Latino scholar. He comes all the way, he just came from Hartford, Connecticut with his wife, Olga. So welcome, Dr. Agosto, and welcome, uh, Olga. And, uh, and once again, welcome to our church. So I wanna uh, just give the mic to, uh, I'm gonna start with Dr. Cruz, is that okay? And they're gonna begin with some statements, they're gonna engage in conversation. Once they're, once they're done, we're gonna open it up to, to you all, so whoever wants to share, ask any questions, um, we will be able to have that conversation. Um, but it's wonderful to have them both here, so Dr. Cruz, please take it away. Thank you, uh, thank you, Eli. Is it working? Yes. Uh, if you need um, a little more. And um, it's, a, it's a privilege and an honor for me to be here this evening um, sharing with you some ideas uh, on a complicated situation, the future of Puerto Rico. So I want to thank Eli for the invitation. Um, and obviously, uh, honored to be here also with Nelson. Um, as I thought of the topic of the future of Puerto Rico, and I reflected upon it over the last week especially, um, I decided that there were some ideas that I would like to share and put into conversation with the group here tonight, not only with Nelson. And I truly mean that because uh, the situation of Puerto Rico is a pretty bad situation. And I thought of two of Pedro Alviso Campos sayings that, um, in fact, I hope he really said these. If not, it's still fine. Because the reason I say that is that I've never looked it up in, in one of his speeches, to be honest. But the first one is, La patria es valor y sacrificio. Uh, the country requires courage and sacrifice. Now, um, I don't want to be overly simplistic, and I don't expect you to answer. But I wonder how many of you who are here have given at least a hundred dollars to the relief. You don't have to raise your hands. That's not my. No, no, no. Maybe in this group, but and I'm not saying it to put anyone down. Actually, 
I see a lot of people concerned, and some people can't, legitimately can't. They give the 10 that for me is 100. I understand that, and I'm a pastor. I know about giving. People give. But sometimes the people who speak the loudest do the least in terms of concrete efforts to, to respond. Now, we know, I want to make it clear, that we cannot resolve the economic situation and the disaster only by us giving. That's not my point. My point is that we're going to need what Alviso said, not just say the words. It's going to take courage and sacrifice. Serious courage and serious sacrifice. So the situation, as I stated a second ago, of our beloved nation is a dire and complicated one. So I wanted to also really discuss that, how complicated it is, because I feel that um, sometimes we don't approach the situation of Puerto Rico like any other situation anyway, as if it's extremely complicated. Therefore, I think, and maybe this is the faith part of me, the pastoral part of me, we need to uh, approach it with humbleness yes. and selflessness. Humbleness and selflessness. And I'll try to es explain what I mean by these two things. Humbleness requires that we be open and not doctrinaire. Okay, um, let me just say something about myself in terms of doctrinaire. We all come with our ideological perspectives. I happen to be a person that my faith influences the way I think. And I'm also a neo-Marxist, although that's not very popular today, right? So I'm a neo-Marxist and a faith person. Uh, Jesus happens to be one of my heroes. So is Lolita Lebron y el Che Guevara. So all those, all those, all those individuals have influenced how I see things and how I think. But the situation in Puerto Rico is so dire and complicated that I have to be capable of being humble enough to know that my ideological and faith perspective is not the one that's going to give the total answer to the situation of the island. That's true. That's good. And we, I think, have to understand as leftists, as nationalists, as independentistas, that theories and ideologies and faith are mere maps to what we're trying to explain and understand, and they're not the actual territory. When you look at a map of a territory, you just seen the map. That's not actually what's on the ground. And we function quite often, one of my concerns it's always been a concern of mine, but it's even greater now because of the horrible situation that Puerto Rico finds itself, is that we who are to the left, independentista, nationalists, or just people who love Puerto Rico without a designation, uh, sometimes we cause the reification of those ideas. What do I mean by reification for those who might not have heard the term? It means when you take something that's an idea and make it out to be something real. Ideas are there in ideology and theory to help us try to map out what we need to do. But when we think that those ideas are real in and of themselves, it becomes complicated because it creates a myopic situation in which we can't see anything else around us. Let me try to give you an example that we, the left nationalist independentista, quite often blame the colonial process for all the economic problems in Puerto Rico. Okay, let me repeat that again. Sometimes we of the left uh, nationalist independentista progressives have a way of blaming all the economic problems in Puerto Rico to the colonial process. And I'll give you an example, at least my humble opinion. I, you know, we could discuss it afterwards. I have a good friend. I don't want to mention his name because he's a good friend and I'm not 
it, it, it's, he didn't do anything wrong. He calls me a few years ago, he says, they're trying to privatize the airport, Luis Muñoz Marin Airport. And La Colonia, the colony, makes this happen. And I said to him, I almost said his name right now. I said to him, listen, um, the privatization of all our institutions is not a problem that's only occurring in Puerto Rico. It's occurring in New Jersey, in New York, and in, on the mainland. Now, in fact, I would suggest to you that privatization might not be bad all the time anyway. We have to assess the situation, but there are situations that I've seen where the privatization of some things in New Jersey have turned out better than when the government ran it. I'm not suggesting that the airport of Puerto Rico be privatized. That's not my point. My point is that it might have something to do with the colonial process, but really what's happening is that it's neoliberal economic policies that are causing that and global capitalism. It's not just a colonial process. What happens when you focus on issues like that, in my opinion, it takes away from the real fight of fighting against the occupation of the nation of Puerto Rico. I've noticed that independentistas, and especially a lot of even white liberals who live in Puerto Rico, in order to attack the colonial process, they attack everything that happens on the island as if it's part of the colonial process. So I have several friends who would tell me, you can't believe the hospital system, and I know the hospital system over there is in bad shape, but the examples they would use would be long lines, you wait three hours, four hours, five hours. I said, I guess they haven't been to an emergency room in Manhattan or in New Jersey. You, I mean, it's a simple example, but it's, it's like focusing and not looking at what's really around and happening. Neo-economic Neoliberal economic policies are truly to blame for the crises that we're facing here in the mainland, in the colonial situation in Puerto Rico, and throughout the world. Global capitalism is putting an end to nation states in terms of nation states deciding which way they're going. So I want to this evening humbly suggest that we need to put some more focus on the immorality of the U.S. occupation of Puerto Rico. And I think we should have a strong campaign to emphasize how it is unjust and immoral simply because it's an occupation. We could talk about all the other issues that result as a part of the occupation of Puerto Rico and the situations that happened to colonial people. That's all good and valid. But at this time and point, my humble opinion is that we need to focus on the fact that the occupation of Puerto Rico is illegal, but even more importantly, immoral. Amen. I don't have to debate whether we'll be better off economically or not under a colonial process or an independent process. The issue is not the economic situation of people. The issue we have to emphasize is that it's immoral. Second, it's illegal. So, to move on quickly, I chose another uh, one of Alviso saying, and I'll end in a few minutes. Donde la tiranía es ley, la revolución es orden. Where tyranny is law, revolution is order. So I would also like to humbly suggest that we need asymmetrical warfare to liberate Puerto Rico from the colonial occupation. What do I mean by asymmetrical warfare? We cannot attempt to fight the United States using the same equipment and the same tools and the same system that they use against us. That's why I get concerned when we start trying to 
cause the liberation of Puerto, make the liberation of Puerto Rico happen by intellectual arguments or showing that the airport now is privatized or that the hospitals don't work. That's not the issue. That happens all over the place. The issue is that it's an immoral occupation and secondly, that it's illegal. So I would like to suggest today asymmetrical warfare and that we have something to learn from our Arab sisters and brothers in terms of how you fight against the empire of the United States. What I admire quite a bit from our Arab sisters and brothers is that they don't try to reason and rationalize and explain why something is wrong when everybody knows it's wrong. I don't have to prove to anyone that occupation is occupation. That a colonial oppression is colonial oppression. I have to work to stop it. But when we try to convince people because we feel that the colonial power demands of us to explain why we shouldn't be colonized, it makes no sense. You cannot have a conversation with an oppressive system. You just have to call it what it is. So, we don't need to try and justify why the colonial process does not work. We simply need to reject the occupation of our homeland with, by all means. Whatever it takes is what we have to do. La patria es valor y sacrificio. By all means, means by all means. Whatever it is that it takes to end the occupation. It might be preaching to bring conscientization to people. It might be that some people have to take up arms. It might be boycotts. It might be giving money. It might be a lot of things. But we need to attack the situation by all means possible. Forget public relations. Arab warriors could give, excuse the language, two shits about the American media and its allies in Europe and what they have to say. We can no longer try to compete or explain or rationalize for the sake of what the imperialist power uh, wants from us. They're not going to change. There's no argument to be had. We need to just decide how and when we're going to start to fight the system by all means necessary. To end, I would like to suggest that something that Felipe Luciano and I have been working on, uh, we need to start buying up land in Puerto Rico. They're going to buy us out. They're going to turn it into a tourist destination for the rich and famous. Um, we see what's happening at this time. Um, I would suggest, and we're trying to mobilize, Felipe and I, uh, different organizations and individuals to start uh, a system in which we can go and together we can do this. If we could get the churches in New York City especially those that are dominantly Puerto Ricans, to start investing some money in, uh, so that we could go to Puerto Rico, literally, I'm not exaggerating, start buying up land. You know, it takes millions and millions and millions of dollars, but if we, just a thousand Puerto Ricans that would contribute a thousand dollars would be a million. That's not enough, but that'd be enough to buy maybe 40 acres of land in Vega Baja. If we don't do it, the gringos and their allies are going to do it. So uh, I end by saying, la patria es valor y sacrificio. Thank you.
I thank the Reverend for that setting that context. I don't think anyone would disagree with it, with any of uh, you know the, especially the some of the uh, the tradition que Don Pedro no dejó. Uh, he said a few, a, a number of things. Some of which oh, they, oh, they, very, I can't think of any aphorism of Don, Don Pedro that doesn't apply today. One, one, that he, one the other that he said was that the United States will, we exist we, for them when we become a problem. We need, to, we need to hear it a little louder. We exist when we become a problem. That's when the, uh, when we, when the United States becomes aware. Another thing that that Don Pedro said is they don't want they don't want the the bird. They want the cage. And so, and, and forgive me, this bird had to get up because I, I, I've, I, uh, I'm not functioning on much sleep and I'm gonna fall asleep, so I'm gonna keep myself going. I, I wanted to just, there were, uh, two images came to mind as I was listening and things that have happened in my life recently. I live with a, I have a very simple life. I go home, I read, I write, and I live with a hamster. So, that's it. So, uh, a, few, a few weeks ago, it was, it was really cold and I was, I was gonna be, a few more than a few weeks ago, but I was, I was gonna leave the hamster for about five or six days, it was cold. And I left, I, you know, tried to put myself in the, you know, in the hamster world. And I put on a heater because, you know, because I thought that was the best thing. You know, I don't know ha hamster uh, anthropology. Or, I just wanna, that's one, and I'm gonna come back to that. And the second is, I was taking a car recently to HITN, where, uh, uh, our Eli spends a lot of time, and a guy who had a GPS, everyone has a GPS, and this freaking guy, he, he, he tells me, I know where I live, and I know where I'm going, but he had a GPS. So, he's looking at his GPS, he's like living in that, and he's like making, it. and then he made, he went, took one way off, and then he went into some rabbit hole. Next thing I know, I get to HITN, two hours, took two, it was like, it's a half hour ride, because, but he's got a GPS, you know, he's going this way, and then he sees red, and then he sees purple. And I'm thinking, forgive me, motherfucker, just look at what's out, look, look, look over here. I'm telling you that you gotta, I don't know, he's got a GPS. Okay, so I'll come back, I'll explain this to you. I'm gonna walk you through a, a quick bit of history that I think contextualizes some of what, the, uh, what, what Sam, Reverend Cruz, told us. The United States went in, occupied in 88, 99, in 1899, Huracan San Siriaco was the most devastating hurricane of that century, much more than Hurricane Maria. Flattened the island, destroyed the island's coffee crop. Everybody, it was just desperate. The United States sent no meaningful hurricane relief. The next year, instead, they devalued the Puerto Rican currency by 40%. Imagine what that would do here. That was their hurricane relief. So, you have a hurricane, currency devaluation, and then the following year, 1901, the Hollander Act created a steeply graduate set of property taxes that never existed in Puerto Rico. So they got three hits in three years. So this is how the America, America rolled at the beginning. General Miles, the, uh, at the occupying general, with a hoisted old, old glory up the flat, up Ponce, and he said, we come here to bring you the blessings and enlightenment of civilization. 20 or 30 years later, the United States, the Puerto, lo, lo Boricua, I said, dude, where's my island? Dude, where's your civilization? All we know is that you come and you've taken our land. Because here's what happened. The Puerto Ricans, because of that hurricane, and that taxation, and that devaluation, were desperate for liquidity. They could only borrow from one place, the American Colonial Bank, but there was no usury law restriction. So the bank could charge whatever they wanted. It was Phil Rizzuto at the money store. Come on down, sure, you could cut money, money going up, because they knew the farmers, they didn't want the loan to be repaid. They wanted the collateral. They got in the land, there you go. and it worked. Within 30 years, American, North American banking syndicates owned 80% of the, of the arable land in Puerto Rico, within 30 years. We're now, now we're in the Depression. Puerto Ricans were made citizens in March 1917. Conveniently, one month before Woodrow Wilson sent his declaration of war, 18,000 Puerto Ricans are conscripted into World War I. That's a coincidence, though, I'm sure. Um, so they go to war, come back, we're American citizens. What do we get? Oh. Gee, the territorial and the supremacy clauses of the U.S. Constitution do not afford us the same privileges and immunities as in the mainland. I went to law school. Can, can you, can you make, decipher what I just said? Damn, I mean, the territorial, excuse me, I'm a citizen. I can go off to war. I can bleed and die, but I can come back and I can't get a minimum wage? That's the citizenship you gave me? So you took my land. You figured that out. Now I'm working on what was my land and I can't feed my family because you're not giving me a minimum wage. 
It was in, within that context that Abisu Campos led the first major successful island-wide agricultural strike. And it worked. It ended up, it shut down the economy for four, four months. Now the United States started paying attention. Porque cuando no hacen un problema, then we exist. So they doubled the wages from seven and a half cents to 15 cents an hour, and people were able to feed their families during the Depression. That was Abisu Campos. That was his great crime. He had graduated from Harvard Law School. He was editorializing, organizing, advocating for the independence, all up and down. He went throughout South America for two years. The United States is fine. They, they have them, they. But when he led that strike, and he, and he hurt Wall Street in the pocket, within a year, they had him in jail. For what? The same thing as Oscar Lopez Rivera, seditious conspiracy against the United States. Apparently, his crime was to lead that agricultural strike because he had done nothing else differently. Now, this was in 1937, in 1936, rather. He died in 1965, that was 29 years later. 25 of those 29 years, he was in jail. He didn't have enough time to commit another crime, so that was a crime, to lead that, that strike. And then the, the other four years, he was surrounded, not stopped, by FBI agents. What else happened <coughs> after that strike? The United States and FDR, from the WPA administration, one of the great democratic presidents, you know, one of our great role models, I, th I think, and yet there was myopia. What, how did he treat, the, what did they do to Puerto Rico? Because of that strike, they sent E. Francis Riggs, a military attache, to be the new police chief, and, Je and Blanton Winship, an army general, to be the new governor. So it wasn't legislators, it wasn't economists during the depression, it was people that understood guns and force. And they went down and they militarized the police force. That's why they went down, because they figured, bueno, el problema que the people, the cops in Puerto Rico are going to beat their own cousin in the head. Then that's why they were able to win the strike. So we need some, so they sent in foreign agents, foreign police, Tommy gun training, and that's how you got the Ponce massacre. So I'm just giving you know, sort of a historical backdrop. So the United States now owns 80% of the land. They're not giving a minimum wage. And when they're forced to, they put people in jail. And they send in a... They militarized the police force. All right, so now we fast forward. Puerto Rico, as an example of this relationship, in 1920, Section 27 of the Merchant Marine Act of 1920 is also known as the Jones Act. And it originally had a protectionist rationale. The Germany had U-2 boats that were the superior submarine technology. They sank about 5,000 boats during World War I. So the Jones Act, was it, was, it made sense to protect the coastline, Atlantic shipping routes, and, and boats. Okay, so there's a, there was, you could see there was a reason then. 98 years later, there's no U-boats lurking off the coastline of Puerto Rico. What the Jones Act is doing is it forces all boats that come into any what's called a foreign registry vessel, any foreign boats come into Puerto Rico, they have to pay money, they have to pay fees, taxes, duties, import quotas to, to be allowed to come into Puerto Rico. The result of that is that, oh, that, by the way, that money goes to the merchant marine to pay for the merchant marine budget. And then all the, because those costs that are added to all those, all those goods, they get passed on to the Puerto Rican consumer. Puerto Rico, as an example of the effect of that, energy in Puerto Rico, la electricidad, is runs entirely on oil, imported oil. So Puerto Rico has to import all its energy. So its energy costs are determined by the Jones Act. Food. The agriculture used to be 70% of the Puerto Rican economy in 1898. It is now less than 1%. It's 0.8%. Puerto Rico isn't feeding itself, and that's part of the revolution, one of the organic changes that we, do, we need to look at. So we have food. Pharmaceuticals. Contra. There was Puerto Rico control, uh, they uh, produced 25% of the world's pharmaceuticals. All the Viagra consumed in the United States was produced in one factory in the town of Bar uh, Barceloneta. So you can't say the Puerto Rican work ethic doesn't contribute to the American, you know, create joy, right? Given half a chance. But those pharmaceuticals come out, and then they have to be paid for astronomically higher by Puerto Ricans. So the result is that the same car in San Juan costs $6,000 more than it does in Miami. Food costs twice as much in Puerto Rico as it does here. I pay nine cents per kilowatt hour for my electricity. Look at your bills, about nine cents. Puerto Ricans pay about 25 cents, three times. The, the, the per capita income of Puerto Ricans is about 17,000, which is less than half that of Mississippi, the poorest state in the union. Yet they're paying more for, for everything. The Jones Act. 
because if it, the, those boats that come in, they, they pass all the costs onto the consumer. Has, there's one other option. Those boats can reroute to Jacksonville, specifically one town, Jacksonville, Florida, where the goods are offloaded the original boat, the far boat, reloaded onto a U.S. boat. Remember that thing, I drink your milkshake? I drink your milkshake. And that's how, that's how the United States drinks Puerto Rico's milkshake. Because that boat then comes from Jacksonville and then it goes back to Puerto Rico. That's like a mafia digging a ditch to fill it up again. And so everything that, that get offloaded in Jacksonville now costs 20% more. That gives the U.S. corporations a big opportunity because they know all the foreign goods are going to come in around 20% higher. So the U.S. goods can come in just a little bit, 18%, 17%. And the U.S. Puerto Ricans are, uh, Puerto Ricans are price sensitive because they don't have a lot of money. So they can save a few pennies on, on, on certain items. They'll, they'll buy the cheaper product. They'll buy the U.S. good. It's for that reason that 80% of the goods purchased in Puerto Rico are from the U.S. There's more Walgreens or Walmarts per square mile in Puerto Rico than anywhere else on the planet. So this is where we are. We can't change the Jones Act. It's, we can with a, you know, a, tremendous, uh, a tremendous wellspring, a tremendous galvanic uh, uh, opinion, an uprise of opinion like it happened in Vieques. But until the information gets out, until we all share that, we become empowered with that information, we make those demands, and we get the rest of the world to understand that, Puerto Rico remains an island. And that's a problem because it's 1,500 miles away. So we're separated by 1,500 miles of ocean, a language. People here are hermetically sealed with a text. I mean, think about kids. Kids aren't even reading. They're doing it. So when you think about the attention span of people and the attention span of Congress, which is less than, than that of a gnat, it's, you have to re-educate people over and, and over again. So I'll just bring you, I'll just give you that one example of the Jones Act. I could give you so many more, the chapter nine bankruptcy, the privatization, I'll, do, I'll just make one more. There's P3s, public-private partnerships coming into Puerto Rico. The governor is doing it on an accelerated basis, but I, I think that they, there's a lot of P5s coming in public-private partnerships for the plunder of Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. Because especially now with this hurricane, you have the, the ports, the airports, the highways, the bridges, the schools, the prisons, all the public infrastructure of Puerto Rico is now up for grabs. And the United States, all they have to do is nothing. And that's a terrible, that's a, all they, it's, a, it's, a, like a, per, it's a perfect win for Naomi Klein, the shock doctrine. Just let Puerto Rico just get more desperate, more desperate and sooner or later they'll beg you for a public-private partnership. And that's a problem because if we, if we don't put in some of these systemic changes, like changing the Jones Act in Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico, I, I believe, is gonna become very vulnerable to this foreign capital, and as, as you said, it's gonna become like Disney because it'll be increasingly owned by, I mean, now even the public infrastructure, the entire, the, you just think, Everything, the roads, bridges, tolls, airports, schools, will become a giant ATM for Wall Street. And Puerto Ricans that can't afford it have to move to Orlando. So we're at a point, and I'll, I'll just wrap up real quick. Where I told you about those two images. Part of the problem is that the United States, they see Puerto Rico through a GPS. They don't understand Puerto Rico any more than I understood my hamster. What happened when I came back to, to my hamster, I, 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 uh, I put the heater on, what I had done is I had evaporated all this freaking water. So I had left my hamster for five days without water because the heater evaporated the water. Um, and so the United States sometimes has that relationship to, to Puerto Rico where they don't really, they, they, it's like smoke signals. And you deal with Congress, they don't fully understand, and they are very susceptible through Citizens United to lobbyists who tell them what the legislation should be, who ran through PROMESA as if it were a PROMESA, which is the most, a backwards, dysfunctional way of approaching a situation where you're trying to draw blood from a stone and there isn't even a stone there. So I'll just leave you with that, that we need to share this information. I was proud that, I was proud and sad that the information in my book has sort of be, gotten into the national conversation a little bit. I noticed that I, I wrote an op-ed in the, in the New York Times about the Jones Act. I submitted that same op-ed for two years and they didn't, they didn't print it until the hurricane. But once they did, people start talking about the Jones Act. So, is the way I see it. I believe that we need to uh, have corporate incentives in Puerto Rico for small farmers. I need to, we need to obligate corporations that go in, like the pharmaceuticals, 
There should be a negotiated uh, infrastructure piece so that any corporation that goes in and gets a 20-year tax abatement on, on uh, interest, dividend, or capital gains income, the way they do, the way John Paulson does, the way the pharmaceuticals did, should, be, uh, should agree to reinvest a small stipulated percentage of their profits in Puerto Rican infrastructure, which they're using. Because that's what happens. They come in, they don't invest, and when the 20-year tax abatement leaves, se fue, se fue, se fue, como black, ya comió, ya se va. So, the 20 year tax incentives to be, to be negotiated with infrastructure investment, to give those same tax incentives to farmers, the Puerto Rican local farmers, to develop alternative technologies, wind, air, sun, which, ab which abounds in Puerto Rico, to re re revivify the agriculture, and to take the Jones Act off the neck of Puerto Rico. I think those are all organic pieces that can be done, and they exist outside of the status argument. They exist as very real, possible uh, uh, empowerment, ways of making Puerto Ricans fully human, fully capable of showing who they are. Because what happened is 100 years ago, they, they chopped off our legs, and then they blame us for not running a race. Give us our legs back, and we'll run that race. God bless you. I am getting an education about Puerto Rico especially the relationship between the United States and the Jones Act and how they cut off our legs. However, um, and that's, I, I can't do a, a brief, I'm not gonna preach, but I, I have to put in context. Professor, you had said that we have not to look at things myopically, and I'm trying to open up my horizons and become hum humble as well to compare our struggle with the Arab brothers, and I have had wonderful Arab you know, uh, neighbors, but the radicals, they want to occupy as well, and we can't forget that, and we can't fight like them. However, we can use the citizenship that we have to demand what we need in this hour, and I do believe that in uniting ourselves and getting these things together, we can do this. So I wanted to find out what you felt about statehood because I think it gives us an opportunity to um, participate in a greater way. However, I understand with the history, there's a lot of, I don't know if I want to be a state. Hawaii was not, um, it was a colony and it became a state and now it's doing much better. Can we discuss what that implication would be? Um, in terms of the, our Arab, Arab sisters and brothers, uh, it's, it, we shouldn't, um, you know, there, you refer to a few of them. Yeah, I'm talking about. So I see, I see a correlation or a similarity between the Palestinian struggle to end the brutal occupation of the territory uh, from the state of Israel as the struggle of Puerto Ricans and other people throughout the world who are struggling for their liberation. They don't want to take the United States. The Palestinians want their land back and they want the occupiers out. And Puerto Ricans, many of us, not all, want the occupiers to get out also. And th in terms of statehood, I would say that I respect you know, people's perspectives because people have perspectives for different reasons. Um, if I think the United States would deoccupy, I don't know if that's a word, but to unoccupy Puerto Rico for 50 years and then tell the Puerto Rican people, now vote, if you want to stay independent or become a state, that'll be a more fair situation. At this point, people are not able to take a serious uh, vote based on their will because the United States, you know when we talk about Russia interfering with our elections? And they didn't. Yes, they, they did. did. No, they didn't. But they did. Not in the way you say. Go ahead. The, All right. Let's, let's assume, okay. since you apparently <coughs> don't want to believe what's there, um, that let's assume, for sake of argument, that the Russians interfered with U.S. elections. Right. Well, the United States has been interfering with the elections that take place in Puerto Rico yeah. Yeah. 
for the last 50 years. So while we're talking about, um, but before that they weren't even able to vote for even what they have now. So the United States has been investing millions upon millions of dollars in propaganda. Also, there are more FBI agents in Puerto Rico harassing people than here in the continental United States. So the United States have not allowed for a free election in Puerto Rico to happen. So you cannot have a free election while there's an occupation. They have to get out first and maybe then let them, let, let the, let's see it after 50 years. I know very few countries, and I assume there are probably none, that no matter how bad their economic situation is, would vote to become part of the United States. People want to be who they are. People want their culture. People want their sovereignty. But don't forget, please don't uh, trash all our Arab I'm brothers and sisters no, when the majority of them, uh, and in fact, I would say, with all due respect, that even the ones who are doing what we consider horrors, it would take them 3,000 years to kill the amount of people that we, the United States, kill in one fell swoop, like we did in Iraq. You know, it, 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 we, we caused the death of hundreds of thousands of people right now in the Middle East, and we feel that it's okay to do because we're the powerful country. How many but, uh, Christians have those radicals killed, eradicated? There is a genocide. As a, as a sociologist, I would say that the number is so short, so small, that it doesn't even no, have any meaning. That's not true. You said you were going to be Regarding <coughs> sainthood, um, I'll approach it in a practical way. Let me just give a, a one, one dimension here. I'd like to be a billionaire. Not because I'm greedy, but it's better to be a billionaire than poor. Right? Right. So, um, and so I think that Puerto Rico as a state would be far preferable to what we have now, which is a colony. After Jose Triamón, the drafter of the, uh, the Commonwealth uh, relationship, he drafted the Constitution. He was the Chief Justice of the uh, uh, Supreme Court of Puerto Rico, okay. the Attorney General of Puerto Rico, he's the right-hand man. He was like, oh, you got Albizu Campos, he's your smart guy? Well, here's our smart guy. We got Jose Triamón, he went to Yale Law School. Well, he published a book called Puerto Rico, The Trials of the Oldest Colony in the World, specifically repudiating the Commonwealth relationship that he supposedly wrote. He wrote a book published by the Yale University Press. It's on Amazon. It's sells pretty well, you, and it's a very well written book, but it, it was a case of, a, you know, this son of a gun had his cake and he ate it too. He was a part of the power structure and he played the game, but then when it was, you know, close to his deathbed conversion so that people wouldn't take it out on his grandchildren or so he could meet his maker with an open conscience, he writes a freaking book admitting, oops, I could have had a V8. Puerto Rico was a colony. Okay, well, it's a colony. And it's preferable, statehood is preferable, but on a practical basis, he consider these things economically, politically, sociologically. Economically, if Puerto Rico became a state, it would be, I would have some leverage against the Jones Act. Carrier Act companies, Crowley, Trailways, Arouses, Sea Star, they would lobby against it. Unions, the Teamsters, the Longshoremen's Union in Jacksonville will lobby against it. The, mer the, mer the Merchant Marine will lobby against it because they get it, or they're, they're agents or they're lobbyists. The consumer manufacturer companies, the ones that are selling the soda, the food, the, the, the medicine, the cars, that are all coming in at 20%, 18%, 15% higher from the United States, they will oppose it. Wall Street, Wall Street sells triple tax exempt bonds, which is a part of the problem that Puerto Rico has right now. Those triple tax exempt bonds are physical crack. Wall Street loves triple, ta triple tax exempt bonds. They sell, the annual yields have been up to 20%. Wall Street does not want to give up does not want to give up those, 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 those triple tax exempt bonds. So now you have Wall Street lobbying against it. So now, so economically, you have the car companies, the product companies, food, Procter & Gamble, unions. So, so we right, give up? Uh, so now, so wait, let me, oh, that's okay. just, let me just ask yeah, okay. the question. Now I'm unfortunately going to listen. <laughs> Politically, the Republican Party is not, in a, right now, does not seem to be too Latino friendly and not too Democrat friendly. Do, do they want seven fire-breathing Democrats to come out of Puerto Rico speaking Spanish and linking up with Mexicans and creating a, a Latino cabal in Congress? Five Dominican, Puerto Rican uh, Congress people, two, two U.S. senators 
They don't want it. In addition, you can add two senators, but under the U.S. Constitution, you can't add five co Congress people without, revisit, without changing the U.S. Constitution. Are they going to amend the U.S. Constitution to allow Puerto Rico? Or, alternatively, in a zero-sum game, you would have to find five states that would willingly concede and say, take my wife, please, sure, you can have my congressional seat. Not in this environment that I see in Washington. Nobody ain't giving up nothing in Washington. So now, regardless of even public, Republican or Democrat, they don't want not going to give up their seats. So politically, we have Donald Trump. He got elected on building a wall and deporting Mexicans. I don't see this as a time they're going to bring, but we're putting Puerto Rico now sociologically. Uh, Ann Coulter writes, Adios America, instant best-selling book. Donald Trump uses chapters 13, 14, and 15 of that book as his program. Read her, I read her book. This is not, she's his campaign manager. And she even said it. He, he should give me royalties on that because he read he read what I she just run. I'm not finished. I'm almost finished. So if politically, economically, and sociologically, Puerto Rico is not going to become a state because Congress is the one under the plenary jurisdiction that that the, the decrees Taylor. What's the point of discussing a move? It's a moot point. Therefore, Occam's razor: when you remove the impossible, whatever is left, however, however improbable, must be considered. If Commonwealth is not working and statehood ain't coming, what are you left with? I, I have to say that I disagree a little bit with what Nelson just said for two reasons. One is, I admit that as a person of faith, and I disclosed myself earlier, I have a hard time with uh, accepting that material goods always supersede values of people and culture. So Pedro Alviso Campo knew that that's a problem. He said, porque el Yankee sabe que por un bollo de pan El ser humano niega su patria y niega su madre, a su madre. Um, Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone. So we have to operate on the higher values than, than just material goods. Uh, but secondly, that there is no evidence that on the statehood, Puerto Ricans would be better off economically or in any other way. I disagree. Well, that's okay. Let me tell you why I disagree. That now? That's what, I'll tell you why I disagree. All you have to do is look at Puerto Ricans in New York City. We're in bad shape. In fact, citizenship is worth nothing because we're in the same situation that undocumented people are, except that we don't live under fear of being deported. So. That helps, but in terms of education, from a statistical point of view, there is no evidence, the evidence is to the contrary, that Puerto Rico will be under the same circumstances. And in fact, we just have to know the United States a little bit to know that not all states are considered equal. Have you been to Alabama or Louisiana? And those are white people there. They live under horrible circumstances. Capitalism destroys people regardless of whether you're a state or not. I doubt that Puerto Rico will be in a better condition. In fact, with all due respect to the Bronx that I love, they have more Hispanic slash mostly Puerto Rican elected officials than any other borough in New York City. And the situation there is dire. And it hasn't changed in 30 years of having Latino representation. That's why I'm saying that we have to go beyond the ideological uh, perspectives that have been informing the way we look at the situation. We have to start looking at it as a moral perspective and an issue of values in order to really create a movement that would put, to some extent, an end to the situation. Because in fact, just because, we, let's say Puerto Rico was liberated tomorrow, that doesn't mean that people are going to be better off economically, but at least in terms of our souls and who we are as a people, we can live with more dignity and start to flourish and deal with our own problems as all other people want throughout the world. So let me, let me just get a, a few more questions and again make it brief. Um, and let me just say, uh, I want to thank HITN. They're here recording uh, today's forum. HITN is, um, was the first 
la Spanish language PBS, basically, a uh, nonprofit. Um, and if you get uh, el, el paquetazo, um, HITN is there. So thank you, HITN, for doing it. So very quickly. Yo quiero decir primero que gracias a Eli por este, convenir esta, esta, esta reunión para nosotros, porque la situación en Puerto Rico es la isla de mi, mi padre. Y so, para mí, lo que eh, da, rompe corazón es la situación en Puerto Rico, pero yo quiero decir, Eli, que tú dijiste algo bien importante, que la ocupación es inmoral, es yeah. ilegal, y yo quiero añadir criminal criminal, ¿ok? Yo quiero decir también importante que como cuando estamos tú estás hablando de recoger los fondos para Puerto Rico, yo hoy no hoy que muchos de los fondos nosotros estamos recogiendo yo por una 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 persona respetable que ella um, estaba diciendo que tienen los fondos se lo están llevando, lo están dando los millones de pesos que están cogiendo y los chavos se lo están robando, eh, um, vino diferente este, yo no quiero mencionar a la persona. Um, otra cosa que tenemos que hacer es uh, hacer una lista o, o, o audit, I'm going to talk in English. We have to make an audit and, and subpoena, uh, subpoena if we have to, the, the number of organizations that are uh, raising money for raising, you know, or for, for Puerto Rico. And because, you know, if it's a foundation by law, right, a foundation we have to give 10% of what they get. So, so assuming that they raise a hundred million dollars in Puerto Rico, all they have to get legally, legally, legally is $10 million. So they pocket nine, $90 million. So, you know, because, so this is important. So we have to know how many organizations are, are just like recogiendo fondo para Puerto Rico, making sure that that money goes to Puerto Rico. Okay. Question, question, question. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I, yes. Um, hi, I'm not a public speaker, but um, thank you, Eli, for this. I have a couple things real quick. I'm a Dominican American, and I, I'm gonna bring that point back to. Um, I guess I studied sociology as well, and I wanted to make sure that we learn from history. Here, we um, oh, we know about Martin Luther King, uh, the um, the Young Lords. And, and such people like that. We have to come together as people, as marginalized people, because that way we're stronger. Um, so and so my plight and your plight is the same plight. Uh, so that's why um, I think that's important. Also, I agree with you, my brother, being uh, Puerto Rico, being a state doesn't make a difference. You could just look at um, gentrification and what gentrification is doing to New York City today. When I was growing up here, these were the projects, um, and now you got condos. Another thing that I want to bring to your attention is what my brother over there was saying. There's people making $400 an hour trying to help Puerto Rico. And so how do we help them invest that money back in our, in our I'm going to say our countries, because uh, they, you don't need $400 an hour to help. I was just saying that. There's a certain fear in the fall of empire, and we see this in Puerto Rican statements of fear of independence, meaning becoming like its neighbors in the Caribbean. Um, so I have three questions. You don't have to answer all of them, but just to start a conversation on this. How do we overcome this fear in order for Puerto Rico to no longer have um, a minority independence party um, in its voting? Or um, what is the future of Puerto Rico if independence comes? As I can imagine, independence would strike more fear of possible deportation of Puerto Ricans here in the mainland, um, possibly. Um, how can um, Puerto Ricans on the island be inspired by independence and in not um, perpetuating capitalism, but causing capitalism's oppression to fall in the Caribbean, Latin America, the global south, and thus globally? Thank you. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask our our, our two uh, I can't say panelists, but to be very brief so we can get the last two questions. Who's gonna? The, the, the questions are just too complicated. I'll, 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 I'll in the short time I'll respond to one of them or to a miss what I consider a myth a misunderstanding um, that independence belief is a minority view in Puerto Rico. I don't buy. 
um, there's a small independence party, but in fact, Nelson was speaking about statehood, some people advocated for what is called radical statehood, uh, Negro Montanel, and basically when the United States looked at it, they said this is really independence what you want. So a lot of the people, the majority of Puerto Ricans want some form of independence and they have some fear because uh, there's been a lot of money spent on instilling fear in people's lives. But that's the case of not only Puerto Ricans, that's the case of everyone. Secondly, I don't even think you need, or well, I know for a fact that you don't need a majority of the people to declare and cause independence because no independent movement throughout the world has been done or accomplished with the majority of the people, including that of the United States from Great Britain. Only 30% of the people in the colonial uh, regions wanted independence from Great Britain. Thank you. Let me get Jasmine, and then I'm, I'm gonna have to finish with uh, Felipe, so. So I have a couple of things to say, and then I have a question. Um, being here on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, I didn't really know what it was to be Puerto Rican. We never learned our culture. Uh, my grandmother didn't speak any English and she raised me. I learned about the history of Puerto Rico in, in college and that's why I decided I was gonna be independista. Like I didn't wanna be a state. I didn't wanna be for a commonwealth. Um, coming back here, I saw that the Latino culture has dwindled dramatically and uh, drastically and I think that there aren't enough um, Latino leaders here that are really invested in organizing and educating on the culture of being Puerto Rican, Dominican, whatever it is. This is it a, a Puerto Rican area, Dominican area? Um, when I went to Puerto Rico, I just got back on Monday, and speaking to folks there, they're unaware of the culture of Puerto Rico too. This history that's in this book, the history that I learned in college, they really don't know. They're miseducated, they close 184 schools, hence why they probably don't know a lot of the things that they're supposed to be know, supposed to know. Um, being here, I feel that uh, we can give them strength because we're very powerful in, in, the, in the states. They don't feel that they're as powerful there. Um, how can we organize locally, especially young people? Like I'm reading this book with a lot of our young people now. We're actually going back during all their breaks, Christmas breaks, midwinter recess. We're going there to contribute to the rebuilding of Puerto Rico. And I think that we need, like, I'm educated. I know, I know the history. I need to be educated by you guys, by you, um, so that I can educate the younger people in this community. Um, but we don't have that here. So my question would be if I wanted to organize groups, whether it's of young people, whether it's of people of Puerto Rican background that are here, just to bring back that sense of, of us being who we are. How can I go about doing that? I tried Googling, there's nothing on Google. There aren't any organizations there. There aren't any groups there. Uh, Hunter College has something that I'm attending on Saturday to see if I can get some resources to bring back to this community. However, that's one person from the Lower East Side attending this. Look at how many people are here now. And this community has a lot of Puerto Rican people. So that's a problem. We're not even, even the educated folks aren't coming out here to learn this. So there's a huge disconnect and I want to work on bringing resources here. So how can I do that? If, if it's getting in touch with you or anyone else, I just definitely want to be part of a, a movement and a solution, not just here, not doing anything, which is why I went to Puerto Rico. I know, I'm sure, I'm sure we both know I, some particular individuals like Ana Lopez, who's very active at, at Oscos, a Tato Torres, who's uh, here in the Lower East Side in Puerto Rico right now, and I could put you in touch, you know, and, and uh, there, there, there's a lot of energy and history in, in both of those people. And I think also two things that can be done is to, uh, like two examples is to be creative, to do something new that inspires people. And I'll give two examples. We've, in the 50s, the marching on Washington, that was a, a kind of paradigm shift. They hadn't done that, sitting in the lunch counters, marching. But that's been, we, that's been done, and it's effective. But I think Washington, is, they see African Americans because they're in front of you. The Civil War, that's part of the texture of American history. But no matter what, Puerto Rico is out. Is still 1,500 miles away. So I think something that has to be like really disruptive in your face, not a march on Washington, a march from, from Orlando, where there's 800,000 Puerto Ricans, a march from Orlando to Jacksonville. That march, 
a disruptive march, a, one that disrupts their business for a while. And that, bring, that focuses, because then people say, the Americans, uh, los blanquitos say, pero que es eso, what's that? They have to ask the question. So the Socratic dialogue starts, what's that about? Why Jacksonville? What's going on? Then they lead, a series of questions will emanate from that that will lead them to the Jones Act. And, and that process will be engaging. It, it engages their intellect as well. So I think, I've been saying this for a while, a march on Jacksonville, and, and repeatedly, to make a país, mira, a la copeta. That's one. Another thing is the power of media. I noticed that when I was, got this op-ed out on the Jones Act about three weeks ago, then it jumped really quickly, and, and it sort of, then it became more, more of a topic. So one thing I've done is I wrote the, it's a kind of a plug, but. I wrote the screenplay adaptation of my book and I'm trying to get it made into a movie because we know the book, but America, the, the people in the outer world, they have to see the movie to think the book is real. Could I just say something quickly? Um, no, that's okay. Um, I said that when I started speaking that we need to get out of the paradigms that we're in. So um, I, I, I respect Ana Lopez and all the people you mentioned, and I agree with that, but we have Eli Valentin here, who, this church, owns a building that's probably worth $4 million. And we need to become creative and say, wait a second, we have, this is a Latino church basically, right? We have a Latino institution. Who, all, who else owns real estate here that's Latino and that is headed by a Puerto Rican man who happens to be a political scientist? So we need to start looking beyond the paradigm that does not allow us to see what's right in our face. Right here, you don't have to go too far if you're from this neighborhood, make a meeting with Eli and start the work here. Amen. Amen. I, we're gonna finalize this, um, and I, I'd like to say this as humbly as I can. And I, I'm gonna bring up two groups. The first group are Hawaiians, who were offered state, statehood. Uh, the queen of the island at that time um, was told, uh, you gotta get out, she didn't, and the business interest, the uh, pineapple interest and the sugar interest, literally formed an army against her. How Hawaii became a state. From that point on, Hawaii began to diminish as a Hawaiian state. The investors that came in were not from Hawaii. They came from all over Asia. Today, you don't see a pure Hawaiian. Rarely do you see a pure Hawaiian in Hawaii. They have a little island somewhere far away where if you're 25%, you can go there. I don't think I have to make any more of an analogy. If Puerto Rico becomes a state, and it's, it's up to you, really. It's up to you. If Puerto Rico becomes a state, there are three South American nations I know that would, if will come to Puerto Rico and make it, we are all are South American, but the first group that would invest would be Brazil, the second group that would invest would be Colombia, and the third would be Mexico. Don't get, not to mention the corporate interest of the United States. Already, already, friends of mine are telling me that whole playas, whole hundreds of acres of land are being bought by hedge funds and banks. Um, what we're saying, what Sam is saying, and I'm going to say this, what Sam and I are saying is there's a possibility, just a possibility, that we can begin to invest in our own country. It happens with uh, American Jewry here. Jewish Americans send money to Israel all the time. Why can't we do that? Why can't we begin to say, how do we buy up land? Malcolm X said, free the land. You cannot become powerful unless you own the land. So we've got to really think about that. Sam said, Professor Cruz said, it's important for us to feed ourselves. No, in fact, um, my brother Nelson said that. We don't feed ourselves. Familia. God doesn't give you many chances. Well, God gives you always chances. But nature doesn't give you two chances. We got a chance to rebuild Puerto Rico again. Yeah. Do you know how important this is? Yeah. No nation gets a chance to rebuild from the bottom up. Yes, people are going to die. But we can reseed it, but we have to take the land first. Number three, folks, we have differing opinions about race, about class, about God. But we must remember that we can't do this ourselves. That's right. 
When Vieques was being fought for, it was being fought for in a bubble, and the, 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 my, the um, fishermen were there. But suddenly Al Sharpton showed up. Do you know that all of a sudden it got time, press, you know, it got press, it got press, he got arrested, and suddenly it blew up. We are not using the relationships that we have in this country. But I know Puerto Ricans who speak Italian, know Italian, are almost Italian. I know Puerto Ricans who know black people, love them, married with them. Do you know what I'm saying? We have people who are, who are very close to it. Let us bring the entire group of our relationships onto the island of Puerto Rico. Let us begin to make this an international move. We cannot do this by ourselves. Let us begin to first build consciousness by having liberation schools. This church can become a liberation school. Everybody in the Baruch houses and the Lillian Wall houses, those kids should be coming here and learning about Puerto Rican history. Your public school, your public school should have Puerto Rican history courses. Oh, but it's a public school. Why not? Demand that they teach a Puerto Rican history. Demand it. We used to have PT, you know, remember those things, Sam, that they used to get out of class now so you get out for religious instruction? Mm -hmm. yeah. We need that. Our kids do not know. Believe it or not, they don't know. No. I'm Puerto Rican, but I don't know what that means. It's because you're not playing Tito Puente. It's because you're not playing Eddie Palmieri. It's because you're not playing Tito Los Panchos, or Felipe Rodriguez, or Daniel Santos. We need to educate our kids not only consciously, but culturally, so that they become strong inside. Right. We need to reach out to black folk because that's our natural ally. Yes. Mm -hmm. Natural. Mm -hmm. I'm going to Chicago next week to speak to Jesse, to speak to Minister Farrakhan. I don't care if you like him or not. I'm going to speak to black folk to say, how can we bring the power of black politics and culture into the whole Puerto Rico argument? Wow. You're not just messing with me. I don't care about Jay-Z, I don't care Beyonce, I want those cats because, let me tell you something, when Chicago gets involved, it's a whole nother ballgame. <laughs> Chicago Bloods have a whole nother perspective, perspective on it. Ellos son garguita de verdad. So now, I end with this. Be very careful with this passivity that I see among Puerto Ricans. Puerto Ricans should have been shutting down schools, should be shutting down a supermarket. We should have been shutting things down. If 500 Israelis were killed in Israel today, or have been, and by the way, we think it's going to reach 500, the people who died. If 500, even 200 people had died in Israel, this city would be turned out. Mm -hmm. That's right. You couldn't move. Wall Street would stop. The universities would stop. Folks, consider yourselves people of color who want, who love their island. Mm. We have to put a stop to this. Finally, I said this. I had a dream. And I woke up crying. I saw two blonde girls on 116th Street, Lexington Avenue, handing out pamphlets about the people who used to be here. And I went up to them, I said, what are you doing? And they had a pamphlet, and they said, well, these are Puerto Ricans. Joe Cuba was born here, Tito Puente was born here, Jimmy Sabatel, Willie Bobo was born here, Manuel Kenda was born here. I said, well, what happened to them? They said they disappeared. And I woke up crying and shaking. To this day, when I think about it, I almost cry. Do not believe that you can't disappear. Some of us want to anyway. There's some of us who are so light in the mind, white in the mind, white in the skin, white in the ideology, we want to be white. But we have to be careful. There are those of us who don't want to go down that way. Yes. The Sioux Indians were a great tribe. And if you read about them, cuss, they kill cuss, but the Sioux Indians disappeared. They got them on reservations in South Dakota, in North Dakota. It can happen, Puerto Rican. Don't think it can't happen. Once they buy out from, from, um, from Aguadilla all the way south. Jesus. Mayagüez, Peñuelas, Guanica, Parguera, Cabo Rojo, Bulle, Combate. They want all of that. And that is why that part of the island has not been serviced yet. It's like a slum landlord. If I allow you the building to deteriorate, I can buy it for pennies. <coughs> That's why Sam and I are asking, we're, we're working on the process 
to have people start sending in money so we can buy it and each of you will be a shareholder. It's not a question of me, look, each of you will be, and we can buy land in mass. And then put up green economies and green things they can have. We need to start looking at farming again, we need to start looking at technology again, and we need to start looking at eco-tourism uh, again. Yes. We can do that. Puerto Rico can be self-reliant. And so in the end, as Nelson is saying, it doesn't matter. But if you love your island, you don't want it to disappear. And the way you do that is by raising consciousness. P.S. If you don't do it, those who are in this room, those who have seen the 60s and the 70s, if you don't do it, you will see an intifada on the part of Puerto Rican youth that you have never seen before. I go to jails and I talk to these kids. Ellos no tienen valor para nada. Te matan a ti, te matan a tu abuela, they don't care. And it's because they haven't been taught. So if you think that you're going to get away from this, you better look at some of these kids on the street. <coughs> you ain't my mother, you ain't my father. It's serious. How can we provide nourishment for our children so that we don't have to work at an intifada because it will happen? Because you can't oppress a people to the point where they cannot take it any longer. They will strap something around their waist and walk into... To, uh, uh, what are these markets that they have, these new supermarkets, and blow everything up. Because when you have nothing to lose, already I see kids fighting in the streets like this. They have, no, they have nothing to lose. We've got to give them something to live for. And Puerto Rico is precisely, and by the way, not only Puerto Rico, but black communities, red communities, yellow communities, we all have the contacts. God is with us. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Mm -hmm. We will make this happen. Que viva Puerto Rico Libre. Thank you. Let's, uh, let's thank our panelists for tonight. And give yourself a round of applause too. So again, on behalf of our church, we thank you for being here and sharing in this conversation. Um, I, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna end in a couple of, give me a couple of minutes. But just so you know, once we're finished, we have some finger foods over here. Please feel free to come right, right over here um, on the other side of this floor. And we have some goodies there uh, for you, so. Thank you, Eli, thank you very much. Oh. Thank you, brother. Oh, no, 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 thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Five key things that I heard today. Can I use the mic if it's okay? Yep. Yeah, I'm not gonna, yeah, I'm gonna 30 seconds. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. We have education for um, the Puerto Rican kids. We have a march. We can't all go to Florida, yes, Papa. We can't. Yes, no, no, <laughs> not just now. We can do something now. Yeah, if all the, the people yeah, in this in this um, room use their uh, connections, we can march here in New York, Why can't we? Why can't okay? So we have lawsuits to make sure that these guys are not taking the money for themselves. Yeah. And there was uh, the other issue, and I forgot what it was, but the thing is we need action now, action items. That's we right. can't just stay here, discuss it, and not try to do something about it. That's why he was saying to you, are you willing as a lawyer to go and do the lawsuit and, and lead us in, we need in a march. going to we need a march. march. We need, we need, we need, need it. March in the Wall Street. Wall Street. Wall Street. Wall Street. Wall Street. Wall Organize our business. Yeah, we, we can do that too. And so before we, before we leave, uh, Linda Lissette has, has a, a, a one minute uh, treat for us. And I'm going to ask you all to stand. Um, and once she begins with her treat, I know you all gonna follow Linda's lead for those that do know it. And this is the treat. So once we're done here, feel free to come join us next door. La tierra de Borinquen, donde Just play.
placidas las olas a sus pies cuando a sus playas llegó Colón. Es que 